All right, so so I think we're uh, we, we want to get started. So I want to uh, really uh, welcome uh, Claudia um, to you know to the to the course. Um, one of the things I want to say at the at the outset already is that this is one of you know a number of papers you'll see throughout the the mini course um, that are using sort of new structural estimation techniques in household finance. So you saw Scott Nelson's presentation a few weeks ago, and also Matteo Benetton is going to present you know his job market paper, which also uses you know a, a lot of structural work and and I think that's something that's sort of exciting for the field you know if you, if you think back five or six years ago household finance work was almost exclusively reduced form empirical work and I think we've seen sort of a bunch of exciting um, structural papers being written um, you know uh, ge generally by recent job candidates um, because I do think um, structural work requires sort of a very particular set of skills that maybe it's a little hard to acquire you know if you don't pick it up during the, the the PhD. But I think, you know, I, I, I want to point that out that this is really something that that's new and, and exciting. And so for those of you who are kind of intrigued by structural work, um, you know, don't be deterred to take the IO courses um, where, you know, you get taught some of the underlying methods. Um, you know, household finance as a field is certainly open to, uh, you know, to, to, to this type of work. And I think, you know, the reason um, we, we haven't seen more of it is really a supply issue rather than a demand issue. You know, these are papers that are, uh, that are you know, not easy to write. And, but, you know, if they're written, I think everyone is, is sort of very open. So I want to just point that out on the methodological side. You know, the field is really quite diverse. And, you know, Claudia is one of the pioneers of bringing these, you know, structural techniques to sort of financial intermediation and household finance questions. And so, um, so I'm, I'm very uh, thankful that you're taking the time to present your job market paper to us. Thank you. Absolutely. I just want to second it. I think there's actually a lot of interest in seeing those more structural methods incorporated in household finance, especially if it's done well. I think that's kind of the thing. It's very hard to do it well. Claudia's paper obviously is one of those examples where um, it's really a nice example of how to use these techniques. And so I think there's a lot of interest that you know, I hope you're, you're feeling in, in this type of work um, to see that. Um, so I think it's very, very highly recommended for people who are interested in that to explore where they can do something well in this space. Floor is all yours. Okay, great. So, so thank you so much, Teresa and, and Johannes for, for the introduction and, and for putting all this together. Uh, so let me share my slides and then we can go into it. So, so as Johannes and Teresa mentioned, I'm going to be talking to you about my job market paper. But before we go into this specific paper, let me give you a bit of a big picture of, of the type of market structure and agents that I'm going to be thinking about in the paper. So the first thing you need to realize is that many transactions nowadays actually happen via intermediaries acting as expert advisors. So when you think about in the context of, for example, financial products, Consumers often deal with brokers or dealers when they're thinking about buying insurance products, uh, personal loans, mortgages, or any sort of like investment products. We see that many households decide to hire some sort of financial advisor. But it's not only about financial products. In many other industries, we also have consumers interacting with expert advisors. And when I mean expert advisor, I basically mean a person that is um, more informed than the consumer. And in a way, it's an expert on the field and it's going to give some sort of recommendation to the consumer. So you could also think about a tax advisors, doctors, lawyers, real estate agents, car dealers. There's all sorts of situations in which consumers have to interact with these expert advisors. Now, the way these expert advisors get paid is going to affect their incentives and ultimately their recommendations to consumers. And there's been a lot of work in the recent years trying to understand what is the nature of these incentives and whether it leads to some sort of conflict of interest between advisors and households. So for example, Mark Egan's work on this topic is, is really like um, it's really interesting. If you're, if you're interested in this topic, you should definitely look at his work. Brian Melzer has also interesting papers. Uh, recently, uh, Gaston Illanes, um, Vivek and Manisha have a paper on variable annuities. And Johannes and Teresa's uh, colleague, Jean Che, also has work on variable annuities and the role of these expert advisors. So as you can see, there's been some work trying to understand how incentives of advisors affect their recommendations to consumers. 
These type of topics have also been of interest to policymakers. And throughout a bunch of countries, a bunch of industries, policymakers are trying to understand how they should regulate the way expert advisors get paid. Should we implement fiduciary duty? Should we restrict the payments these advisors? Should we put some sort of license uh, process? There's a lot of examples of new regulations that are implemented, and some of them were work out really well, some of them are complete fiascos. So that's really good when you're thinking about a topic that, that you want to do in your dissertation, because if you also see that there's new regulations coming in, that also creates sources of variation that, that you could use. Now, the paper that I'm going to be talking to you today about essentially contributes to this policy debate by focusing of, on the role of these expert advisors in the context of mortgage market. So in mortgage markets, these expert advisors take the form of mortgage brokers. And in fact, essentially mortgage brokers are gonna act as an intermediary between households and banks. And it's very important that you understand that these intermediaries um, do not hold a balance sheet. They are just basically, in a way you could think of this as a market maker or a matchmaker between the banks and the consumer. Now, in many countries, mortgage brokers are a very popular choice among consumers. So for example, in the UK, which is the market that I'm gonna be talking to you about, they account for 50% of all mortgage originations in the country. If you look at other countries such as the US, Australia or Canada, these mortgage brokers also account for a significant share of all mortgage originations. So what type of services do, the, do these mortgage brokers provide that makes them so popular? So let's try to dig into that. Well, let's consider a standard mortgage market. We have households. They found a house that they like, they wanna buy it, and they need a mortgage to do so. On the other side of the market, we're gonna have banks or lenders offering different types of mortgage products. Households can follow the more traditional approach and they can go directly to the banks. You could think of these as going to a nearby branch or using some sort of these online sales platforms. Alternatively, households can pay a fixed fee and hire a broker. Now, when you think of a broker, you should not think of a one person firm. These are not the usual broker companies. The usual broker companies are quite large and effectively they provide two types of services to consumers. First, they're gonna give advice on available products. So they're gonna recommend consumers which mortgage to buy. And the second service they're gonna provide is some sort of um, help with all the application process. So for those of you who have a mortgage, I know students probably, <laughs> you don't have much experience in this market, but for those of you who have, getting a mortgage is a very painful and um, lengthy experience. So brokers are gonna speed up the process and they're gonna help consumers at the end of the day, get a mortgage product from one of the banks. Now, brokers are gonna deal with some banks, not with all banks, and usually they don't have exclusive agreements. So each broker has a portfolio of banks which they, with whom they do business, and, and usually they're gonna offer those type of mortgages to consumers. Now, for every mortgage a broker gets, they're gonna get a commission payments from each of the banks. Now these commission payments are a percentage of the loan. And what's gonna matter a lot is the fact that these commission payments are very different depending on the bank that is making the mortgage. So you might be worried that because brokers get different payments from different banks, that this is gonna affect somehow their recommendation to consumers. So effectively what we might be worried is that there's a potential agency problem between households and brokers. So for example, imagine I'm a consumer and I go to the broker and the broker steers me to a product that pays him a higher commission. If this product is also more expensive for the consumer, you can see that there's a misalignment of incentives between what the broker wants and what the consumer wants. And this can potentially be detrimental for consumers. Now the papers that I mentioned before focus on this side of the problem. Right? So this is more of a demand approach, right? Consumers demand broker services, broker's recommendations might be distorted by some sort of supply side incentives. The goal of this paper is the following. On the one hand, I'm gonna try to quantify this agency problem, see whether it's actually there. 
But the point that I'm going to try to make is the following. Brokers can have negative effect on consumers through this agency problem, but they can also have positive effect of consumers via two channels. First, brokers may increase efficiency in the market. So if you believe that brokers reduce search costs for consumers, or they may reduce costs for banks, well, this may actually increase efficiency in the market, which could ultimately lead to lower prices for consumers. Brokers may also increase competition amongst banks. So as, as you can see throughout today, and you will see later uh, with Mateo's paper, banking, banking uh, sector is usually very concentrated. We have very few banks in many industries. And, and effectively, if you have an intermediary, there's the chance that small new banks may enter the market through this intermediary. So if the fact of having brokers in this market increases competition, and this also leads to lower prices, this is also good news for consumers. So at the end of the day, what I'm going to try to think about in this paper is this general equilibrium argument that there is a trade-off. On the one hand, brokers may be detrimental for consumers if there's a big agency problem. But on the other hand, they may have a positive effect on consumers via their general equilibrium effect on prices by increases in efficiency or competition. So what are regulators doing, given that there's a potential trade-off? Well, many regulators in, in not only mortgage markets, but in other markets, they, are decided, they have decided to ban all commission payments between brokers and consumers. And sorry, between brokers and, and banks. And this is going to have the positive effect of reducing the agency problem. So that's good news. However, it's also going to have unintended consequences in terms of upstream competition and efficiency. And it's not really obvious which of these sides of the trade-off is going to dominate in equilibrium. So that's exactly where this paper comes in. So in this paper, I'm going to use this really cool data set on UK mortgages. And essentially, I'm going to observe all mortgages originated in the UK between 2015 and 2016. And what's really cool about this data set is that for every mortgage originated in the UK, I'm going to observe which broker originated the mortgage, as well as every single payment the broker received, both from the bank and from the consumer. Now, the fact that I have such detailed data on these, on these payments that brokers get is going to allow me to answer some questions that the literature didn't address, not because they weren't interesting, but because um, the, the data was just not there. So whenever you get a new data set, I think the first thing that you need to ask yourself is, what is the comparative advantage of this data set? What does this data allow me to do that other people weren't able to do because the data wasn't available? So in my case, it's these payments to brokers that people usually don't have in their data sets. So using this data, I essentially do a supply and demand model that is going to capture this trade-off that I just mentioned. And I'm going to use the model to answer three questions. First, I'm going to try to understand how whether brokers react to commission payments. And in a way, I want to quantify how much of a problem is the fact that brokers get paid by banks. The second question I want to answer is whether brokers actually have positive effect for consumers. Is it the case that because brokers are there, competition amongst the bank is higher, or whether there's some sort of efficiency gains um, by having brokers in this market? Now, once I have quantified both sides of the trade-off, I can actually simulate uh, new regulations. And in particular, I'm going to be interested on what would happen to consumers if the regulator was to uh, restrict the way brokers get paid. OK, so let's get into details of the paper. Well, as I mentioned before, um, I'm going to use data from the UK. It's a very detailed data set. I have a lot of mortgage characteristics, a lot of borrower characteristics, including income, credit score, and a lot of details. So it's not Danish data, but it's close enough. Um, and as I mentioned before, I'm going to observe every single payment the broker got both from the consumer and from the bank for every single mortgage the broker originated. Now, as I also mentioned before, in the UK, 50% of all mortgages are originated through brokers. 
And in particular, when I go to the estimation of the model, I'm going to look mostly at first time buyers. And for this type of borrowers, brokers actually uh, originate 72% of uh, mortgages. Now, you're not supposed to know anything about the UK mortgage market. I'm not like, I don't expect you to know that. And usually when you're doing research, um, if you do your job market paper on a country that is not the US, then you really need to make sure that it's not, there's gonna be some specific details in the country, but you always need to try to relate it to the US or to a more general market structure so that people will care. So in my case, I'm gonna give you the crash course on UK mortgages. You'll get the second version of this in Mateo's presentation. But what I wanna tell you today is effectively the three things you need to know about the UK mortgage market to understand my paper. So the first thing you need to know is that in the UK, we have a very concentrated upstream market. What do I mean by that? So we have what we call the big six banks that account for 75% of all mortgage originations. However, in the last years, we've actually seen entry of what we call challenger banks. So these challenger banks, you could think of them as fringe banks, and they're a lot smaller than the big banks. And they have actually a very different business model. So the big banks, they have a lot of branches. They rely heavily on advertisement. These challenger banks don't have many branches. They don't rely on advertisement. However, what they do is they pay very high commissions to brokers. So in a way, you can see that over the last 10 years, they've been trying to introduce their products in the market by paying very high commissions to brokers. The second thing you need to know is that the broker market is also very concentrated in the UK once you zoom in at the local level. So if you look at the national level, we have 20 large broker companies, but once you zoom at the local level, what you see is that usually the top four brokers in the area account for more than 80% of the market. So even at the local level, people do not really shop for brokers. Like there's four big brokers and, and basically they have most of the market share. And the final thing you need to know is how do these brokers get paid? Well, 85% of broker revenue actually comes from the banks. So in the UK, most brokers do not get paid by the consumers. So 60% of all brokers charge zero to consumers. So they uh, operate what they call a fee-free advice system. And essentially they are getting get all the revenue from the banks and people are fully aware that this is going on. Now, how much they get paid by the banks varies a lot. So same bank can pay a lot to one broker and very little to another broker. And the same broker could get a lot from one bank and nothing from another bank. So there's gonna be a lot of heterogeneity on, on how much they get paid by the banks. Now, before I jump into the model, I need to show you what the data is actually telling us. Because right now I've been telling you about this trade-off that I think it's, it's the first order effect in the data, but I haven't shown you anything regarding this trade-off. And I think this is very important if you're doing a structural work. So if you look at IO papers like 20 years ago, the first table was already demand estimates. There was no reduced form evidence, no like summary statistics table sometimes. Now the standards have changed. So now when you do structural work, you can no longer do a black box and just hope that people believe what you're saying. So when you look at especially job market papers on structural work, before they jump into the model, they're gonna have this very intense reduced form section in which it may not be like completely causal, but at least they're trying to show you that this variation and the correlation that they're gonna like input in the model is actually there. In the so here in the presentation, I'm just gonna give you the correlations. In the paper, I also had um, more details on, um, on, on the time regressions and a bit more serious analysis. But for now, the only thing you need to know is the raw correlations, which are the following. What I see in the data is the following. If there's a, very, a product with a very high commission, it's very likely that that product also has very high broker sales. And this happens in the cross section as well as in the time series. 
So if you're looking at a particular product and that product increases the commission for a particular broker, that broker is a lot more likely to sell it. And this correlation is very robust in the data. The second thing that I see in the data is that whenever there's a lot of brokers in one county, competition amongst the banks is also very high. It's also the case that brokers are a lot more likely to sell mortgages from these small new banks. So at the end of the day, if you look at the data, it seems that the trade-off that I've been talking to you about is actually there. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to try to develop a model to quantify this trade-off in equilibrium. And then I'm going to use the model to simulate policy regulation. So let me give you a sketch of the model. So it's going to be a static equilibrium model. So I'm going to shut down all dynamics. And there's going to be effectively three agents, households, banks, and brokers. It's going to be a supply and a demand model. So let me tell you about supply first. At the beginning of every period, each broker and each bank is going to meet. They're going to meet. And they're going to negotiate whether the broker can sell the bank's products. If they reach an agreement, they're going to set a commission rate. And then the broker can add the bank to its portfolio of uh, lenders that they do business with. If they don't reach an agreement, the broker cannot sell any of the bank's products. Okay, so you could think of this process as a network formation. So at the end of all negotiations, each broker is going to have a portfolio of banks with whom it can do business. Once commissions are set, banks are going to choose interest rates to maximize their expected profits. On the demand side, we're going to have households, and households are going to face two sequential decisions. First, households are going to choose whether they're going to go directly to the banks. You could think of it as like search themselves, or they're going to delegate this process and hire a broker. If they decide to hire a broker, then they're going to make the decision with the broker. If they decide to search themselves, they're going to have to pay a shopping cost. This choice is going to depend on the shopping cost of consumers, as well as the expected payoffs of going directly to the banks as opposed to the brokers. Now, once they have committed to a distribution channel, brokers or direct sales, they're going to choose a mortgage that maximizes their, their payoffs. I'm going to assume that consumers going directly to banks are going to choose the product that maximizes their indirect utility. Okay, they're going to have a payoff function and they're going to choose the product in their choices that maximizes that indirect utility. Consumers going to brokers are going to face a different problem because now instead of having one agent making the decision, you're going to have two agents. So I'm going to model this interaction between the broker and the consumer as a weighted average of their joint utilities. So the idea is that broker and consumer meet and they're going to choose the product that maximizes the weighted average of their joint utilities. Now, what's key here is that if the broker was perfectly benevolent, the broker will maximize only the consumer's utility. Therefore, if I find that the broker also puts weights on its own utility, I'm going to interpret this as an agency product. OK, so this is a short presentation. Um, so let me just tell you what I find from this model. If you're curious about the model, just, just read the paper. But this is what I find. The first thing that I find is that in this negotiation between the broker and the consumer, the broker is able to extract 40% of consumer surplus. So in a way, brokers are not perfectly benevolent, but brokers don't completely rip off consumers. In a way, when the broker and the consumer meet, they're going to split the surplus almost 50-50. So there is an agency problem, but it's not the whole, it doesn't go all the way to like completely ripping up the consumer. I also find that shopping costs are fairly high in these markets. So consumers do find it hard to find the right mortgage or to do all the paperwork to get the mortgage. I also find that consumers that go directly to banks, more often than not, go to the nearest branch. Uh, so they don't really shop around um, banks. Now, what about from the bank's point of view? 
Well, as it turns out, it seems that the brokers have a more efficient technology of originating mortgages than the branches. So the marginal cost of the banks is actually lower through the broker channel than through the uh, branches. So if I was the social planner, I would want all mortgages done through the broker because they're more efficient. And finally, what I find is that brokers also have a cost of originated mortgages and effectively their cost is a lot higher one when they go to these small new banks. So once you get the parameters and then once you get like the model estimated, you can play with it. You can actually start having some fun. So I'm gonna run three types of counterfactuals. Two of them, you could think of them as the extreme cases. The first counterfactual is, we know brokers are distorted. Let's just ban them. Let's say that brokers cannot operate in this market. What's gonna happen? Well, what's gonna happen is that if there's no brokers, everybody's gonna go directly to banks. They're gonna have to pay the shopping costs, which are gonna increase, uh, decrease consumer welfare. And on top of that, since people go in direct, go to the nearest branch, and the small banks don't have branches, what's gonna happen is that competition is gonna drop amongst the banks, and overall prices are gonna go up. So this is horrible news for consumers. In the other extreme, we can decide to force everyone to go to the brokers. So you could think of this as a policy making advice mandatory. You can say, if you want a mortgage, you need to hire an advisor. What's gonna happen then? Well, the first thing that's gonna happen is that since everybody goes to the broker and brokers are now the only option to sell mortgages, their bargaining power with the banks is gonna go up by a lot. So they're gonna be able to extract a lot of rents from banks. However, there's a positive side that because now all banks need to deal with brokers in a way it levels the playing field and competition actually goes up amongst the banks. So there's like two forces going on, like higher commissions, which means higher prices because there's a pass through. And then there's also gonna be like more competition amongst the bank, which reduces prices. At the end of the day, it kind of like evens out. But I think that what I wanted to run these two extreme counterfactuals is because once you see these two extremes, you realize that what's really driving efficiency in this market is the fact that you have both branches and brokers competing downstream. And finally, the last counterfactual is, okay, imagine we wanna keep both, we wanna keep direct sales and broker sales, what's gonna happen if we restrict the way brokers get paid? So I'm running out of time, so let me just give you the intuition of what happens in this counterfactual. Imagine that we ban commissions, so brokers can no longer pay by the banks. This is good news because it's gonna like align incentives between the consumer and the broker. However, if the bank, if the brokers are not getting paid by the banks, they're gonna have to get paid by someone. <laughs> so what's gonna happen is that the fee consumers pay to brokers is gonna go up. Now, this can be good or bad. If I pay a higher fee, but I get a much better product, I might be okay with it as a consumer. Right, so there's a trade-off. I pay more, but I may get a better product. So it's not sure whether consumers like this or not. There's also a trade-off for brokers because before brokers were getting paid by the banks and they were getting paid more by these new banks. Now these new banks um, can no longer pay brokers. So it's gonna be more expensive for brokers to do originate products with them because remember they have a higher cost. However, they also have cheaper prices, which consumers like. So they once again, there's a trade-off between what the broker will do and what the consumer will do. At the end of the day, this is what happens. In this new equilibrium, brokers decide not to do almost any business with the new banks because these banks are so costly for them that they decide to exclude them from their network. This is gonna reduce competition in the broker channel. Now, because consumers are no longer getting a better product to the brokers, they don't wanna pay the higher fees. So they're gonna to move to the direct channel. And once they're in the direct channel, they go to the nearest branch, competition also drops. Bottom line, this is horrible news for the consumers and prices are gonna go up by 10%. 
So let me just wrap up and give you a bit of what is the big picture of the paper and where do I see the literature going forward? Well, the first thing I think, at least the key point of my paper is the following. Whenever you're thinking about restricting compensation to expert advisors, I think what regulators are forgetting is that there's always a trade-off. And I think that's where economist way of thinking, it comes in very handy because we all know that there's no free lunch. So a lot of the times when you read these policy reports, they are focusing on this agency problem, which is great because it could be a real problem in many markets. However, they forget about the fact that supply will always react to regulation. And it's not only demand that it's gonna be affected, but also competition is gonna change, prices may change, and this can lead to really unintended consequences in terms of both competition and efficiency, which can actually backfire, as is the case in the UK. So going forward, I do think that there's a lot of work to be done when it comes to non-price competition in household finance. I think a lot of the work has been focusing a lot on prices and how firms compete in prices and how consumers react to prices. And it's great work. I think that we still need to find other ways in which firms uh, decrease their competition and by, for example, uh, competing in quality, they might bundle products. They may also uh, invest in advertisement, or for example, they could add fees to the products in, in ways that consumers don't, don't really, there's an elasticity and they could be more or less elastic to these fees. So I do think, and I'm happy, I think this is more like conversation we can have in the happy hour or two, but I think what's, I think where I see the field going forward is as an intersection between finance and household finance, IO and macro. And I think right now it's the, these three fields, we are talking to each other, we're cooperating together. And I think that's where the, the future, that's where I see the field going, like less of silos, but more as a, like a combination of all these tools. So thanks. That's it. Thank, thank you very much, Claudia. I think there, you know, there's obviously, you know, as you as highlight, a bunch of things we want to bring up um, in, in the discussion. I mean, one thing I want to highlight right away, just because, you know, it links your paper to some of the discussions we've had earlier. So, so the two aspects of this trade-off that you have in your paper um, about the role of brokers, I think is sort of, a, is kind of shows up in, 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 in other places in this market too. So the first one is that just the agency conflict, right? And so, you know, we've, we've talked a bunch in this class and, and, and with other presenters about why, markets like the mortgage market, why peer effects are so strong in these markets, right? Why, why does it matter so much that when your friend gets a mortgage somewhere, you also go there? And I think one of the th recurring themes that keeps coming up is that, you know, a, a lot of the other players in these markets, intermediaries like mortgage brokers, their incentives aren't perfectly aligned with yours, you know? And so when they tell you, oh, this is a great deal, you kind of, you know, you're always skeptical a little bit about are they getting these kickbacks? You know, what are, what is their incentive structure look like, et cetera. But it seems to be that sort of the, the, the friends, the family, the colleagues that tell you about things. They're one of the few players in these markets that don't have these big agency conflicts. And so I think it kind of, you know, the fact that you show that these agency conflicts are sort of substantial and, and, and you know, that the brokers therefore you know, pick up a ton of the consumer surplus, I think kind of, you know, helps motivate that. I think the other thing is, we, I, we talked a little bit in the introduction about, you know, and I think it, it's kind of uh, in the motivation, you know, in, in, in your paper about, um, you know, insufficient search in mortgage markets, right? And sort of, the, you know, the Woodward and Hall paper in 2012, but, you know, people have shown this in, in, in many other settings too, that, you know, there's so much price dispersion in this market and it's largely because individuals don't search very much. Um, and when individuals don't search a lot, that gives huge market power to the sort of, you know, the incumbent players because they know, even though there's many other people you could go to, if you come to me, you might only compare me with at most one other person, maybe no one at all and gives me a lot of market power to extract surplus. And so um, what I really like about your work is the, is that it kind of has this market structure as being endogenous, as being something that, you know, and, and, and kind of this idea that, you know, while mortgage brokers might have these agency conflicts, they also, it's something you can think about them as dramatically reducing the search cost. It just gives you an ability to, you know, very effectively and, you know, with someone who knows the market well and someone who can guide you, compare many more prices together. And so, you know, should therefore help reduce price dispersion in these markets and therefore increase efficiency. So I think kind of links nicely also 
to this, and, you know, and we had Chris Palmer present some of his work on search in the car loan market, um, you know, where some of the very same, same features exist, but well, we don't have these intermediaries yet. And so thinking about the role of intermediaries and in markets where you're trading off, you know, what their incentives are versus them helping reduce search frictions and, and, and so on, I think is, is, is overall, a, you know, an interesting topic. And I just wanted to kind of highlight to everyone these links between the various papers. Um, so thank you, Claudia. We'll look forward to having you back at five Eastern. Um, and I think there's going to be a bunch of questions around, um, you know, around working with international data that I think are sort of relevant for everybody. Um, you know, and just generally this debate you've, you know, that we've started about sort of the the, the relative benefits of structural and 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 reduced form work and sort of how that fits together. That I think is great. Thank you very much.